All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, great. So last time, uh, last time we spent the whole class showing that you could define an isomorphism between the integers and the fundamental group of the circle uh, by taking sending each integer to omega n, which is just the path that goes around the circle n times, um, either uh, counterclockwise if n is positive or uh, clockwise if n is negative. Right? And we showed this was an isomorphism. And this came down to studying the, um, the covering space. given by the real line over the circle. Okay. Uh, so what we showed was that given any path in the circle, you could lift it to a path in the real line. And it was unique as soon as you picked where you were going to lift the base point. And the same was true for homotopies. OK, that's what we did last time. Any questions on last time? OK, great. So uh, now that we have a non-trivial fundamental group, uh, we will start by seeing some consequences of that. Right? So the first one, as we anticipated last time, is the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says that if, if p um, is any um, any polynomial uh, in the, re the complex numbers? Um, then uh, either p is a constant, or it has a root. in the complex plane. OK? <clears throat> Wonderful. So as you know, this uh, theorem took a, a long time to prove. It was, um, I think, D'Alembert in, in like the 1730s who first tried to prove it. And then uh, Gauss uh, famously, in his uh, PhD thesis, uh, starts by saying, it's a very important theorem. Nobody's given a proof. Here are four different proofs. Right? And they're not quite right, but they're close. Um, OK, here's, here's a very different proof uh, from what Gauss did. Um, so let so assume that p, given in this way, does not have any roots. Right? So what we want to show is that p must be a constant, right? So degree 0 polynomial. Well, so if it doesn't have any roots, then let uh, g of s be the map uh, where you take p. And um, we want to go around, OK, let's, let's put an r. And let's go around the circle to pi i s of radius r. But let's, um, let's fix things so that you start at, um, at 1. So you start on the, uh, at 1 on the real line. And then let's fix things so that you stay on the unit circle. Right, so the thing we're dividing by is, by hypothesis, never equal to 0. So it's OK to do that. And of course, the, the modulus of this is always 1. So uh, for each r, 
this uh, defines uh, a, a uh, loop in the circle considered as part of the complex plane based at, uh, at 1, at the complex number 1. Right. OK, they are clearly all homotopic, because this is a, a continuous family uh, in R. And um, so uh, they are all homotopic. And g sub 0 is the constant loop. Right. So the class of G R in uh, in the fundamental group is this. Is the same as the class of zero. Right. Okay. On the other hand. OK, on the other hand, if you have a polynomial like this, then a key fact is that if you're far enough from the origin, then the first term dominates. Right? So let's take advantage of that to, to, uh, to find a simpler polynomial, um, a simpler loop uh, still in the same homotopy class. So um, let r be larger than both 1 and what you get by summing all of the coefficients. Right. So if, if we look at the um, complex numbers at, at radius r, then um, the size of the leading term Right, r to the n, which we could write as r times r to the n minus 1, is greater than, um, well, this number times r to the n minus 1. Uh, and that is uh, greater than or equal to uh, a1 z to the n minus 1 plus um, so on to a n. Right, where of course there we're using the triangle inequality and we're using that r is greater than 1 to, um, to say that, oh, well, this one is bigger than, than uh, r raised to the n minus 2 or r raised to any power less than n minus 1. Okay, so that tells us that. Um, if you were to uh, modify these polynomials by putting a t in front of uh, all of the <coughs> lower order terms, then this does not have roots with mod c equal to capital R. Right. OK, for any t, for any t in 0, 1. So now take this description of g, fix uh, little r equal to capital R, but change the polynomial by putting in uh, t. Right. So consider. Um, Um, call it g sub r of t and uh, s, which is the same thing as before, but now we have a uh, piece of t. r divided by the module.
Okay, this is a homotopy. Uh, between G sub R and um, say G sub R of zero. All right, so what happens when T is equal to zero? When T is equal to zero, the polynomial is just C to the n, right? And if you're just doing C to the n, then uh, this uh, gives you e to the 2 pi i n s, right? And if you write that out, that's exactly the class of omega n. Right, that's just the formula we had for omega n written in complex coordinates. Um, hence, the class of omega 0 is equal to the class of omega n. But we showed last time that phi is injective. So that's equivalent to saying that n is equal to 0. And that's what we wanted. OK, so if you like, in spirit, it's not all that different from D'Alembert's original uh, attempt of a proof, which, which actually you can fix to make a real proof. Uh, because D'Alembert also said, well, for large uh, modulus, um, we only care about the leading term. And then um, what he said was, um, look at the absolute value, the modulus of the polynomial and uh, assume that its, uh, its minimum is achieved at the origin and is not equal to 0, then you look at the, um, the next term, the first uh, non-constant term. And he said that for small um, modulus, that's the only one you need to care about. So by comparing the, the first non-zero term for small modulus with the leading term for large modulus, he was able to show that there had to be uh, a um, a root by the intermediate value theorem. So, so if you like, it's not that far from the original proof, but um, uh, but it's very slick because we just used the uh, fundamental uh, the fundamental group of the circle. Okay, um, here is another application: uh, the Borsuk. Uh, no, I think we do Browler fixed point first. So. Um, Uh, great. So the next thing is a, a theorem, a very important theorem by Brouwer. Uh, Brouwer, um, you've probably heard of, um, well, if in Dutch, Brouwer as a word just means a person who brews beer. So you may have heard that. But uh, this refers to uh, uh, L.E.J. Brouwer, uh, who was um, a mathematician, um, very famous for uh, the intuitionistic uh, approach to the foundations of math. So uh, this is an approach that uh, claims um, that um, you're not allowed to use the law of excluded middle, at least when you're talking about something infinite. right? So to prove that something is true, it is not enough to prove that negating it is false. right? So um, a similar sort of thing is that if you want to construct a set, for Brouwer, it's not enough for you to just tell me, OK, I'm going to take a, a subset of this a uh, bigger set um, by this rule. For Brouwer, you have to also show that there is an algorithm that take, in a finite number of steps determines whether or not a given element is in that set. Otherwise, your definition doesn't count. Right? Um, so at the time, um, it was not very popular. Uh, but, uh, but with the rise of computer science, then uh, you know, well, if you want a computer to, to decide um, define a set, then you really do need to have a finite algorithm that determines whether or not an element is in a set. So now with computer science, intu intuitionistic um, foundations make a lot more sense or a lot more relevant. Uh, but what's great about Brouwer is that when he was getting his PhD, so 1908 or something, uh, he, 
he was already thinking about this, and he couldn't convince his advisor that this was a good idea. So the advisor told him, OK, if that's what you want to do, first, you have to make your reputation so people will take you seriously. And then you can do this. So, so amazingly, in, in four years, he proved an amazing amount of theorems and topology, very important, including the one we're about to see. And uh, as soon as he got tenure, he stopped working in topology. <laughs> He sort of renounced his theorems because, as we're about to see, the proof is very the opposite of intuitionistic. It's reduction, uh, reductio ad absurdum, right? So it's going to use the excluded middle to prove the theorem. Uh, but yeah, as soon as he, uh, he got tenure, he, he renounced these proofs and only talked about intuitionistic mathematics from then on. OK, but here's what his theorem says. Uh, if you have any continuous map, from the two-dimensional disk, two-dimensional disk, then you have to have a fixed point. Right? So there is some point. Um, that f of x leaves where it was. OK. So this is true in higher dimensions as well. Um, and we will prove it in arbitrary dimensions uh, later. But at the moment, our tool uh, just gives us the one for the disk, the two-dimensional disk. <clears throat> OK, so proof. So as anticipated, we're just going to uh, assume the opposite and see that that's false, and then uh, spite Brouwer by claiming that hence this is true. Right. So is this his proof? Uh, almost. Uh, yeah, so it's the same argument, except that he doesn't use the fundamental uh, group of the circle. Uh, he uses uh, the notion of degree, which is another one of the things he, he came up with in those four years. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, other than that, it's essentially the, the, the mm -hmm. same argument. Um, so uh, assume that this doesn't happen. Uh, assume f of x is different from x for all x and d2. OK, so we're going to construct a map, um, define, define r from the disk as one. So here's the picture. Uh, you have a point x. You hit it with f, and you land somewhere different necessarily. right? So you're going to look at the ray that begins at f of x, goes through x, and then hits the circle, and call that point r of x. Right? So define r of x as the intersection with the boundary circle of the ray from f of x through x. OK? So it's easy to see that r of x is continuous. Um, because if you were to move x a little bit, then by continuity of f, that's just going to move f a little bit. And then the ray is only going to move a little bit. So uh, I'll let you write down details if you feel so inclined. Uh, but here's an important property of the way we defined it is that R fixes all points on the boundary circle. Right? So in terms that we talked about before, R is actually a retraction. OK? So that's a problem. That's a problem because given, given any loop um, h uh, into the circle, 
um, viewed as a subset of the disk, it is no homotopic in D2, right? Because D2 is a convex subset of Rn. So you can always um, just take the, the constant loop with the same base point and then take the convex combination and move this loop to that one. Certainly, yeah. So what you can do is take uh, h sub t to be uh, 1 minus t times h plus t times the constant loop at the base point. Right? And because uh, d2 is convex, this stays inside d2. Right? OK, but, uh, but then r composed with h sub t is a null homotopy uh, in the circle starting at r composed with h naught, which is r composed with h, which is just h, because h takes values in the circle, and r is the identity on the circle. Right? So what we've done is we've taken an arbitrary loop on the circle, and we've shown that it's null homotopic. Right? But that's not true, because the fundamental group is not trivial. Right? So this contradicts Right, so we've reached a contradiction, and that finishes the proof. Our initial assumption must have been wrong, because we do allow the law of excluded middle. OK, so fixed point theorems are wonderful, because they give you existence. Right? It's really hard to prove existence. Um, that's, if you like, why the proof that the fundamental group of the circle is not trivial uh, was difficult, because we had to prove that something existed, and we had to do it by constructing it little by little. Right? Um, so, so when you have a fixed point theorem, then that's, that's a really strong tool you can use to prove that things exist. So if, for example, uh, solutions to, to equations exist. Okay. So the next application is uh, Borsuk Ulam, and uh, it's set. Borsuk Ulam. So um, these are Polish mathematicians. So um, Brouwer proved his theorem in 1910 or so. Uh, these are Polish mathematicians who proved this in, uh, in um, this next theorem in like 1933 or something, so shortly before World War II. So if you think back, this is a, a wonderful time for, for mathematics in Poland. This is when Banach was there, and they had the whole uh, Scottish cafe thing going on. Um, unfortunately, um, things did not go well for Poland in World War II. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so Borsuk stayed there and tried to, um, to keep the University of Warsaw going like, completely underground. They would just meet in, in coffee shops and stuff and have classes there for the students who were still around. Uh, Ulam went to the United States, and he was uh, uh, very influential in, uh, in creating the hydrogen bomb. But before that, uh, when they were in Poland, uh, and life was good, they showed that if you have any, any map from, um, I guess I want S2 to R2. Um, must have antipodal points uh, where it takes the same value. Right, so that is, there exists some point in S2 such that f of x is the same as f of minus x 
we were putting S2 inside R3 so that we can use uh, vectors to reflect. OK, so to see why this is surprising, if it's not immediately surprising, um, so take a, think of S2 as being the, sphere, the Earth. And take any two measurements that you can assume are continuous, like wind speed and temperature. And this says that at any moment, there are uh, opposite points on the Earth where those two measurements are exactly the same. OK, so uh, and again, this is true in higher dimensions as well, but uh, we'll, we'll get there eventually. So the proof is similar in that uh, assume that it's not true. And um, so let G of um, S be, um, so take F of, uh, uh, well, let's say g of x, f of x minus f of minus x, and then divide by the difference. So g takes points on S2, and then this is a, an, a vector in R2, but I divide by its length, so I end up with something on the circle. OK, so great. So again, we want to get a contradiction by looking at uh, classes in, uh, in the circle. right? Of course, this is mapping from S2, so it's not giving us something in the fundamental group. But we can just pick the equator, for example, to get a map from S1 to S1 that then we can study in the fundamental group. So uh, let eta be just a parametrization uh, of the equator. So I uh, just take s to cosine uh, 2 pi s, sine 2 pi s, 0, where we view this as sitting inside R3. And uh, take h to be uh, g composed with eta. So now this is a path, 0, 1 to s1. Right. Um, OK. So on the one hand, h is clearly null homotopic. Right, so it's homotopic to a constant map. Right, and why? Because uh, the equator inside S2 is null homotopic. Right, you can just take the equator and lift it up until you get to the North Pole, and now you just have a point. Right, so, uh, so if you give me a homotopy that starts at eta and ends up at a constant map, I can just compose that homotopy with G, and that'll give me homotopy from h to a, a constant map. Right? So since um, uh, if, since um, with eta t, a no homotopy of eta, uh, h sub t equal to g composed with eta t is a no homotopy. OK, on the other hand, OK, so if we stare at G, um, G 
g has the property that if you look at minus x, you get minus what you got at x. Right? Um, of course, you should think of things as going living in S2 or S1. So this says that G takes antipodal points to antipodal points. Right? Uh, in fact, maybe let's say anti of uh, G of x, well, it's G of the antipodal point of x is equal to the antipodal point of G of x. All right, so what this means for h is that h of s plus 1 half is equal to the antipodal point of h of s. This is for all. s and 0, 1 half. OK? So if you just look halfway around, then um, then you're just taking the antipodal point. Right? So what we want to do with this is we want to show that H is not null homotopic. Right? So we're going to think about what this means if you were to take uh, this loop H and lift it to a path in, on the real line. Okay? So um, if H tilde is a lift, of um, h to a path in R, um, OK. Um, we can use the fact that. Um, OK, so let's remember we have the real line winding around, sitting above the circle, we have p. So if you have a point here, and so it lifts to there and there um, and there, then um, uh, if you look at the antipodal point, then it would lift to here and here and here. And it's always, right, to go from an x to an x, you would go a full uh, integer, right? So to go to the antipodal point, that's exactly halfway there, right? So you would go up by half an integer, right? So uh, the fact is that if you look at the p inverse of the antipodal point of something, you get uh, p inverse of x plus 1 half, right? So as sets. Uh, this, for example, if this were uh, 0, then these would be the integers, and these would be the half integers. So what that tells us about h is that when you lift, uh, h tilde of s plus 1 half is equal to h tilde of s plus q over 2, where um, q is an odd integer. Right? Just because um, this guy is in this set and this guy is in this set. Right? Notice that this Q, uh, we justify its existence at every S. And in principle, that means that it could be a different Q for different S. But of course, this is continuous and this is continuous. So this Q, if it were a function of S, would be a continuous function of S valued in the integers. And the only continuous functions into the integers are constant. Right? So this q is a constant. It's the same one for all s. <clears throat> OK. Um, great. So we have that equation. Let's plug in a couple interesting values of s. So if s is 1, uh, if s is 0, then we see that this is true. And if s is 1 half, then we see that this is true. And if you plug this one into this one, 
you get h tilde of zero plus q. Right? Now remember that our, our isomorphism was uh, just pick the lift that starts at zero. Right? So if, uh, if h tilde of zero is zero, then h tilde of one is equal to q. And since we know that q is odd, it is not zero. Right? Um, so this tells us that the class of h is the same as the class of omega q in pi 1 of s1. And q odd implies that this class is not the class of omega 0. And that's a contradiction. I have not. Borsuk means either Beaver or Badger, I don't remember, uh -huh. in uh, Slavic languages. And so in that book, uh, instead of the QED symbol, they draw a little Badger. Badger. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. There is a, uh, a lovely um, analytic proof of Borsuk uh, due to Milnor. Um, I've put a link to it uh, on the course website. OK, uh, here's an easy consequence of borsuk um, So let's say that you take um, a1, a2, a3 inside the sphere. And these are closed subsets such that the sphere is equal to a1 union a2 union a3. then at least one of these sets contains antipodal, an antipodal pair. OK, so it's, this is also true in all dimensions. So for example, for the circle, this says that if you write the circle as a union of two closed subsets, at least one of them has to contain antipodal points. Right? So you can think that if you were just doing uh, a very simple division into two connected intervals, then, uh, well, since they're closed and uh, they cover everything, then the, the endpoints are going to be uh, antipodal. Um, and you can see that you need closed. Uh, because if you were to allow half closed, then you could just have one of the points be on one half interval, one interval, and the other point, the antipodal point, be in the other one. So we do need closed. Okay, so the proof, well, I want to use borsuk so I just need to cook up a useful map from S2 to R2, right? So. Um, for each ai, let uh, di from uh, s2 to r be the distance to ai. Right? So di of point x is the infimum or the minimum. Uh, among all of the y's in AI of the distance between x and y, uh, where we're using the Euclidean distance by putting s2 into r3. OK, and then let f of x be uh, d1, comma d2. OK, so borsuk um theorem, right before I erase it, implies that there is some point for which f takes the same value on that point and the antipodal point.
this is great. So there's a point so that the distance to A1 of that point and the antipodal point are the same. And the distance to A2 is also the same. Right? So if either one of these is 0, we win. If they're both non-zero, then both x and minus x have to be in A3, because they're not in A1 or A2. So we also win. Right? So if either of these x and minus x are corresponding ai, otherwise, x and minus x are not in A1 union U2, hence must be in A3. Yes? So can we use this to prove that you can't have a convex polyhedron with only three faces? Convex polyhedron with only three faces. My thought being that you can essentially inflate it to a sphere, and then if one of the sets has an, you know, an antipodal pair, then you would have a line going straight through the origin, which if you start by assuming that the origin is in the interior of the polyhedron, that gives you a contradiction. That might work. Hmm. No. This ends up having... Uh -huh potential implications for, you know, like geometry. And right. It's certainly, uh, you can do something uh, the opposite of that to see that four sets are enough. Because you can just put right. a polyhedron with four sides yeah. inside, and then it just uh, project out to a sphere. And there are your four sets without yeah. antipodal points that do cover the sphere. Tetrahedron, poke a hole in it, get an air pump. There you go. You're exactly. Go. Yeah. OK. Um, OK, any questions on these applications? OK. Uh, right, so as I mentioned, they're true in higher dimensions. And once we have uh, homology theory worked out, then we'll be able to prove them. Um, so I think there's one more thing I wanted to say, maybe later. OK. So back to the theory. Uh, great. So here is a, a simple fact. If uh, x and y are path connected, Uh, then the fundamental group of x times y, um, say with base point x naught y naught, is the product of the groups. Okay. So. This is nice and easy because uh, a map into x times y is continuous if and only if uh, the induced maps uh, into x and into y Are continuous. So, of course, by induced maps, what I mean is that you could project onto the left factor or you could project onto the right factor, and the composition uh, of these maps is what needs to be continuous. Right? And this determines the topology, the product topology on x times y. 
So these are precisely the continuous maps into x times y. Right? Well, OK, great. So that means that a loop um, in x times y is just uh, the product of a loop in x and a loop in y. Right? And um, a homotopy in x times y is just a product of a homotopy in x and a homotopy in y. Right? So this is nice. So you could just say, um, so let's give this a name, pi x um, composed with f, and this pi y composed with f. So the map pi 1 of x times y, base point x naught y naught, to pi 1 of x x naught times pi 1 of y, y not given by sending the class of a loop to uh, the class of the loop in x and the loop in y. Well, first of all, it's well-defined, right? Because homotopies correspond to homotopies. And it's bijective, because every map like this comes from a map like this. Uh, so this is a bijection. And it is a homomorphism because concatenation here just means concatenate in each coordinate here. Right? And so this is a, a group homomorphism. And since it's a bijective group homomorphism, uh, it is a um, isomorphism. OK, so this is pretty direct. So that gives us a few more examples. That means that the fundamental group of uh, the n-dimensional torus so here, uh, this refers to S1 cross itself and times. Right? We use uh, t instead of s because s to the n means the n-dimensional sphere. Right? And so to avoid confusion, we use this. Well, so this is then equal to uh, c to the n. Right? So for example, for the two-dimensional torus, well, uh, you have one loop that goes around here and one loop that goes around there. And uh, these are generators of C2. Right? Um, <clears throat> and by this proposition, um, it's, it's just C times itself. So it's, it's a commutative group. Yeah. Once you fix the points. Right, so like I1 That's right. So you're right. I could have just left out the, the base points. Um, yeah, I don't think I use path connectedness at all. OK. So the thing that made, oh, one more thing before we get there. OK, 
Okay, here's another part of the theory. So, induced homomorphisms. Okay, so first notation. Uh, if we say that uh, a map goes from xx0 to yy0, this means that you have a map from x to y, and it happens to send x0 to y0. Right? So it's faster to just include that in the, uh, in the notation for, for phi. Right? Uh, more generally, um, so also, if, um, if you have a subset of x and a subset of y, then um, phi mapping the pair xA to uh, yb means that you have a map from x to y. And phi of A lands inside B. Right, so it's just convenient to include that in the notation uh, when you're writing phi. <clears throat> okay, so the point, of course, is that given uh, a map of pairs uh, or of based point, uh, sets, we get a map. from the fundamental groups at these points. By taking uh, a, a class of a loop and sending it to the composition. Of course, you have to make sure that this is well defined, because this is really a homotopy class of, of paths. But um, if uh, f sub t is a homotopy between f0 and f1, then phi composed with f sub t is a homotopy. between the corresponding images. So this is well-defined. Right. Uh, moreover, it's a group homomorphism. Right, so if um, Uh, if f and g are both elements here, <clears throat> then phi composed with the concatenation is equal to uh, the concatenation of the compositions since both are given by the map that sends s to uh, phi of f of 2s if uh, s is in 0, 1 half, and phi of g of 2s minus 1 if s is in 1 half 1. Right? As you can easily see in either case. Right? So we have this equality at the level of paths. So it certainly survives to homotopy classes. Right? So that's great. Every time you have a continuous map between spaces, you get a map between homotopy groups. Right? The loops you start with are based at some point, and the loops you end with are just based at the image of that point.
OK, uh, some easy properties that are worth pointing out. <clears throat> so let's say that you have um, x, x naught mapped to y, y naught, and then another map that sends you to z, z naught. All right, then um, since uh, composition v of, uh, v of f, since composition is associative, um, we have uh, v composed with the induced map of the composition is equal to the composition of the induced maps, S maps um, from pi 1 of x, x naught to pi 1 of c, z naught. <clears throat> and an even easier fact is that if you look at the identity map of a topological space, then the induced map uh, the identity on the fundamental group. Right? Because you do nothing. Yes? So what this is giving us essentially is some sort of connection, I'm not sure exactly how to formalize it, between some version of the category of topological spaces and the category of groups. groups. That's where I was going. Yes. Uh, exactly. So these facts are exactly what you need these facts say that um, the fundamental group is a functor. From the category of based topological spaces, right? So uh, objects are, consist of a topological space together with a point on that topological space. So you fix a point uh, with continuous maps. Um, let's say based continuous maps. So our two objects are topological spaces with uh, choices of points, and we're only interested in those maps that send the point in x to the point in y. And the category of groups with, um, with group homomorphisms. Uh, so in, indeed, all of the things we're going to see uh, both this semester and next semester, so all of the homotopy groups and all of the homology and cohomology groups are all functors from um, topological spaces to some algebraic category. So it, it's, uh, in a sense, it's even better. Uh, so something we definitely will not cover. But um, uh, later this semester, we're going to introduce the homology groups. So there's a homology functor. And uh, the stuff that uh, Randy McCarthy works on uh, is about uh, like constructing uh, Taylor expansions for arbitrary functors. And so you can ask, well, what, what's the derivative of a functor? So it's like a linear approximation. And what's a linear functor? A homology theory. So for people who do category theory, uh, homology theories, which is what we're going to study later on in the semester, uh, are the, the simplest functors, the ones that you approximate everything else by. Uh, so yeah, not only 
is everything a functor, but they're the important ones somehow. Turns out. <clears throat> okay, great. So, next example. is uh, the sphere. So uh, pi 1 of Sn is trivial if n is greater than or equal to 2. Well, example slash theorem. OK, so this is intuitively obvious, right? Because you give me a loop, I just contract it to a point, and we're done, right? But um, Whereas on Rn, um, the intuition is easy to carry out, because if you have a convex subset of Rn, you can just contract the whole convex set to Rn. So it doesn't matter where the loop ended up, you just contract the whole thing. Sn is itself not contractible, it turns out. There is an n-dimensional hole there that you can't just collapse away well, without changing something. Um, so. Um, it's a little harder to carry out to intuition. If things were smooth, that would not be a problem. We would just do the same thing. Just follow your nose. But we have to do things for continuous maps. And uh, continuous maps uh, include uh, space-filling curves. Right? So you can take um, a map from Rn to Rm with uh, n strictly smaller than m. And you can cook up a continuous uh, surjective function. Right? So that's messed up. Uh, and so you have to worry about that here. Right? So, so let's worry about that. OK. So uh, let f be a, ma a path into Sn. So if there's a point. Uh, X and Sn. So, of course, I want this to be a based loop. Right, so there's some point X0 in Sn, and both endpoints go to that point. So, if there's some point in Sn um, <coughs> that is not in the image of F, then it's easy, right? Then Since Sn minus that point is contractible, we can compose uh, F with a null homotopy that F is trivial. In the fundamental group, right? So the problem is, okay, what if you don't have a point that it misses, or you don't know that you have a point that f misses? So in general, uh, we'll show that we can homotope. Uh, f uh, relative to endpoints. So there's a path homotopy uh, to a map that is not subjective. So f is based at x0. Pick a ball, say, centered at 
at a point um, x1 um, whose closure does not contain x0. Okay, so let's just stay away from x0 because we don't want to change the base point. We want our loops to stay based. But we're going to have this ball, and there's a point at its center x1, and then the path f, um, you know, maybe entering this ball many times and doing all sorts of silly things. Who knows? Right? So uh, what we want to do is modify only the parts of f that go into this ball. And we're just not very ambitious. We just want it to miss the center. Right? Just stay away from the center. And then we win. Right? Then we just contract the whole sphere. OK. So if we look at um, f inverse of b, then because f is continuous, this is an open subset of the interval. And hence, this is a union of, of intervals, is a union of intervals. Could be infinitely many. OK, but if we look at, um, so let a1 be 1 be the intervals, um, the intervals in here containing Uh, point um, uh, that f sends to x1, then these are finitely many. By a compactness argument. So on each, if you look at the, the closed interval, then the um, um, f must send the endpoints to the boundary of the ball. Right, because that's how these intervals were constructed. They're the, the uh, connected components of um, the inverse image of uh, b. OK, and now uh, since um, since n is at least 2, if you take the ball and remove uh, a point, then this is path connected. So there is some path that starts here and ends there and doesn't go through the center. Right? Of course, this is easy. I mean, you could just stay on the boundary of the ball and go from there to there, because that's connected. But in any case, here's where we're using that, uh, the dimensional restriction. And b is uh, convex. So um, uh, let gi be a path, be such a path, well, I haven't said one, be a path in here from f of ai to f of bi. And um, 
by convexity. Of B, uh, these are homotopic. Right, whereby these I mean F restricted to this interval and, um, and GI. Okay, so make these finitely many modifications. Replace each uh, F restricted to one of these intervals with uh, a GI, uh, and this changes F within its homotopy class within its based homotopy class, because this ball does not include x0, and uh, ends up with a path that misses the center of the ball. Right. So uh, changing f in these intervals um, produces the f prime in the same path homotopy class uh, but uh, with x1 in Sn minus the image of f prime. Hence, um, null homotopic. OK. So here's a corollary. What I started to say a moment ago, what really made uh, Brouwer famous is that he was the first person to show that dimension is a topological invariant. Right? So um, it was surprisingly hard. Uh, it turned out, to show that Rn and Rm are not homeomorphic if n is different from m. Right? So Brouwer was the one who was able to do that. Um, so at the moment, uh, again, our tools are just getting started. So we can do uh, R2. So R2 is not homeomorphic <clears throat> to Rm for m different. Right? And again, what makes this difficult is that there are space-filling curves. So you, do, you have obvious uh, injective maps from Rn to Rm if n is less than m. And you have non-obvious but continuous surjective maps from Rn to Rm. And so you can use that to put together uh, a, a bijection, but it won't be continuous. Right? So, um, so that's why it was hard to show that, um, that just in general, there's no homeomorphism between them. Right? So uh, proof. So well, just look what happens if you remove a point. Um, so removing a point disconnects R. Uh, and not. R n for n greater than 1. So those are not homeomorphic. OK, so R is not homeomorphic to anything larger, uh, in particular not R2. Um, on the other hand, uh, for R2, well, let's say in general, R n <coughs> minus a point minus, say, the origin, is uh, homeomorphic to Sn minus 1 cross R, or R plus, if you like. This is just polar coordinates. <clears throat> well, of course, something I'm using is that if they're homeomorphic, then you can remove a point from each one, and those spaces will be homeomorphic. Right? So let's see what happens if you remove a point. So uh, pi 1 of Rn minus 0 is, uh, is trivial um, for n greater than 2 and non-trivial 
for n equal to 2. Right? And of course, if you have um, a homeomorphism, then uh, the, uh, the composition with the inverse would be the identity map, either on R2 or on Rm, depending on which order you do the composition. But if it's the identity map, then the induced map is the identity. And the induced map of composition is the composition of the induced maps. So you would have uh, group isomorphisms <coughs> between the fundamental groups. Right? So the fact that the fundamental groups are different is enough to see that they're not homeomorphic. Yes? So presumably, if we replace the subscript 1 with the pi with a higher number, but we could extend this to showing that higher dimensional real spaces aren't homeomorphic to one That's right. That's right. So next semester, um, we'll do higher homotopy groups, and that'll work. But later this semester, we'll do homology, and that'll be strong enough to, to run this argument. OK. Yeah. Um, so let me just point out uh, the thing I mentioned there at the end. Uh, note that if phi is a homeomorphism, then the induced map is an isomorphism. Since um, if y to x psi is uh, the inverse of phi, then psi star is the inverse of phi star. Yes? Uh, 